Welcome to American History. This is part two of my series of lectures on American History 1302, kind of the second half. This is our uh, part two, which is westward expansion. Uh, this is the lead-in slide. We'll talk about, give you kind of a brief outline. We're going to talk about Native American tribes in the West. The big idea being uh, that the uh, tribes, that the West area of America, west of the Mississippi, was populated. We're going to talk very briefly about, you know, what's going on out there. A few theories on a thesis statement kind of on Native Americans. If you've uh, gone over my 1301 part, uh, part one of that, I have all my thesis statement out there. I try to build a really good case. So we're going to revisit that right now and then uh, uh, get the area of America west of the Mississippi populated. We have to deal with the Native Americans before we can repopulate the west with the white man. Then we'll get the repopulation going. This is going to be the Plain Wars, 1865 to 1900. Uh, for most historians, that's a little bit broad. It really might be uh, 1875, 1876 to maybe uh, 1899, 1898. But this is going to help us. I think this is a good Paul Park figure, 1865 to 1900, right after the Civil War to the end of the century. Then we'll take a look at uh, the people who are moving west. We're going to take a look at the motives. Gold, land, escape. We'll take a look for the mechanisms uh, for the people who are moving west. Wagon train ships, pros and cons. Um, it's not up there. We'll all take a look at give you guys a little bit of a survey of who it is that's moving west. Finally, we'll talk about the legacy. And this is going to be Frederick Jackson Turner. We will actually start with him. And then I'll summarize that later on after all the evidence has been presented to you. We will also talk about Alfred Thayer Mahan. And that's in an effort to set up the next part, uh, which is uh, the Gilded Age, the Progressive Era. And we're going to need Alfred, Alfred Thayer Mahan uh, to get started on that. We'll also talk about Charles Beard. He's an economist. And he starts to put things into an economic, uh, theoretical context. And he's going to be important as we're going into the 1920s, 1930s. So we're going to need both of those guys to move forward. Uh, but they were uh, active, you know, they're kind of associated with the turn of the century, so this will be a good place to kind of insert those personalities. So with this sort of uh, outline in mind, Native Americans, Plains Wars, uh, the people who are moving west, the motives for moving west, uh, the mechanisms to go there. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. We're going to start with a theory, a thesis statement, and then I'm going to start kind of macro and then go micro. And then... Um, give you some evidence, then we'll get the Plains War started. All right, let's talk. Let's start talking about Native Americans west of the Mississippi, as we're coming out of the Civil War era, sort of 1865, 1870, 1875. And first off, we have to start with a thesis statement: Native Americans contained everything we associate with civilization except an easily transmittable form of writing. A wide variety of theorists, a wide variety of historians have made this conclusion, and to keep it very simple, once again, our thesis statement on Native Americans in the, in the macro is that Native Americans contained everything we associate about with civilization. They had everything in their society that we think of, all the indicators of civilization, except an easily transmittable form of writing. And the Central American tribes were probably really kind of on the cusp of that. Uh, the Inca had a very sophisticated form of writing, but it's been really it's really been lost, and we just don't know how it actually worked because it was very uh, uh, organic in its form. The North American Native Americans, especially on the plains and out west, the reason why they never developed an easily transmittable form of writing is they just didn't need it. They just didn't need it. There was no need in their civilization for that. However, they did have a strong polity, they had strong technology, they had a powerful spirituality, uh, they had a division of labor, uh, they had everything we associate with civilization except an easily transmittable form of writing. What I'm trying to do here is dispel a myth that Native Americans, especially those west of the, of the Mississippi, were just out there on the plains or out there uh, in, the, in, in the wide open running around in grass skirts harpooning buffalo and they were just basically um, uh, unsophisticated people laying around waiting to be conquered that is untrue 
dispel that. They had everything we associate with civilization except an easily transmittable form of writing. Furthermore, as we're going to find out, many of these Native American tribes had been in constant low-level conflict over each other, over resources. And so, you know, they're used to making treaties. They're used to understanding their own territorial boundaries. But more importantly, probably, they're used to being, uh, they're, they're very powerful warriors. They have a warrior class. They have the technology useful for war. And that has gone back for centuries and centuries and centuries. So the idea that the white man is simply going to show up and the Native Americans are simply going to lie down and, and be conquered, that's false. West of the Mississippi, in terms of numbers, this is kind of hard to come by. Obviously, we have no census, but the estimation is west of the Mississippi, as we're coming out of the Civil War, uh, so 1870s, probably about 2 million Native Americans existed west of the Mississippi. That number's up for a lot of debate. I'm willing to go as high as 2.5 million, probably as low as 1.75 million. But for the purpose of this class, 2 million is about right. Now what's important about this number in the macro? That is about as much as the ecology could support. And what I'm driving at here is when you have a hunter-gatherer society, a single individual needs maybe about a square mile, uh, some estimates are up to 10 square miles, to have enough energy, enough game, enough plant matter in a hunter-gatherer society to exist. An individual may require up to 10 square miles, depending on the terrain, to be able to subsist. Now, balance that against agricultural community, where you have farming, you only need about 40 or 50 acres. So 360 acres to the square mile. So an individual in a hunter-gatherer society need a vast treasure of land. In other words, if a group is put together, well, they need hundreds of square miles to be able to exist. So when we talk about 2 million people west of the Mississippi, that actually doesn't sound like much when you think of the vast amount of terrain there. But in a hunter-gatherer society, that's about as much as the ecology could support. Maybe a little larger, maybe a little bit less, but that's about right. Now, let's get this, in other words, that's the macro. Let's go down half a step. When we talk about Native Americans populating the West, we never think of California, for example, as being a state that's associated with Native Americans. We just don't think of California. You say California, oh, Native Americans, yeah, that's right. No, nobody ever thinks about that. But if you look at the map on the left side of the screen there, you'll see that in the 1800s, there were, in other words, before the white man really populated California and drove the Native Americans out, it was populated from side to side and from north to south. For example, if you're aware of what you know California topography is like, Southern California and Southern Central California especially, sort of 29 Palms, Barstow, I don't know, Fort Irwin, California, and Edwards Air Force Base. That's Death Valley. But as you can see from the map here, there were Native Americans there. Look carefully at the northern edge of California, sort of inland. One of the tribal groups that have staked out an area there is the Modocs. And the Modoc War was 1898-1899, and they gave the U.S. Army fits. This is a very, uh, the terrain up there is uh, volcanic, uh, it's very tangled up terrain, and the Modocs have been living there since time immemorial. They were familiar with the terrain, and when the army came in to sort of bring them to heal, they, the Modocs, gave the army absolute fits. So California, you know, Native Americans. A couple of other quick examples. Uh, John Dana wrote a book called Two Years Before the Mass. Herman Melville, as you may know, wrote Moby Dick. Both of these men were actually sailors. Then they authored books later on. And both of them had actually uh, landed at one point or another in Southern California. And both of them briefly described the Native Americans that they personally saw there. Now Dana especially talks about how they were just rather short and really deeply darkly tanned. 
and sort of dried up husks of, indiv of individuals. Well, in the port of Los Angeles and San Diego, which is in Southern California, that's exactly what you would anticipate. So we're not talking about a, a huge number of people, especially in Southern California. We're not talking about a tremendous civilization. The ecology wouldn't support that. But whether or not California had Native Americans, they did. We just don't think of it that way. So kind of go broad for just a second. That means Oregon, Washington State, Utah, uh, all those western states had significant Native American populations. So the west was populated about as much as the ecology could stand. Well, with that in mind, let's go on uh, to the next slide then, and uh, we'll kind of go down a little bit, talk about the Plains tribes, because those are the next, those are actually the first ones that are really going to come in contact with the white man in the post-Civil War uh, era. So let's go on to the next slide and just kind of do a little bit more of a drill down. All right, we're still kind of looking at the, at the macro here, uh, but I want to draw your attention to this map of the Native Americans, where they were roughly located in the Plains states. So I think this is a pretty useful map for that. There's some obvious uh, uh, exceptions to what's going on here. You don't see the Hopi or the Navajo in New Mexico. You don't see the five civilized tribes in Oklahoma, but that's okay. These are most of the Plains tribes. I just want to give you an idea. So first off, what I want you guys to get out of the map here, we're not talking about one or two or three tribes. When we do the drill down, then we will have to do that. We'll have to take kind of a micro view of it. But this, we're still kind of in the macro. And you can see the, the Sioux Nation, the Northern Cheyenne, they take up a huge region up there. The Mandans, by this time, they've been beaten down by disease, and then they kind of recover. Uh, the Kiowa, the Arapaho, the Shoshone, they're taking up huge areas. Okay? Well, the Sioux in particular, they're going to be that first Native American uh, um, tribes to, to really come into uh, significant contact with the white man in the post-Civil War era. So what I want to draw your attention to is there's a sort of a caterpillar effect as the whites are moving to the west. In other words, they started out obviously on the east coast and they began pushing in land, the white man did. And as they pushed in land, either the Native Americans died, of which 90% will die of disease. Please never forget that. But the Native American tribes were so widely uh, spread out in North America that what would happen is all this 90% would die of disease, but it wouldn't affect the next kind of level, the next surface, if you will, the next level of Native American tribes further inland. But the white man would occupy all the lands, the Native Americans either being dead or defeated, and then that next group, let's say in the Appalachians, they would be affected by disease and they would die. Then we get into the Ohio River Valley, and then that's the Shawnee, the Ojibwa, and then they would be wiped out. Uh, in that, in the 1830s especially, the five civilized tribes, the Choctaw, Cherokee, Chickasaw, Creek, and Seminole, they're going to be removed peaceably, but many will still die of disease. We've already talked about that in 1301. That's the Trail of Tears, and they're going to be put into Oklahoma. At about that same time, the Sac and Fox and the rest of the Shawnee, the Winnebagoes, they're all going to be pushed out onto the plains. And this is what I'm driving at. This is what's important. The Sioux Nation, for example, they're really a forest tribe in upper Minnesota and in Wisconsin. But as the white man in the 16 and 1700s began to push west, through the area east of the Mississippi, they began to push west, you crowd more and more Indians further west in a sort of a caterpillar effect. So in the mid-1700s or so, it is thought, the Sioux are kicked out onto the prairie. At about that same time, they become horse-mounted. Uh, there's finally enough wild horses, there's enough knowledge to understand how to use horses, and the Sioux become horse-mounted. Now this is transformational for all of the Plains tribes. The Sioux, the Arakawa, uh, the Cheyenne, the, the, the Shoshone in particular, um, they become horse mounted and that makes the, tri the, the plains really genuinely accessible. A hundred years later, here we are in the 1850s, 1860s, the Native American tribes are crowded onto the plains and they're fighting over limited resources. Now this is important. 
It drives them to experience constant low-level warfare among each other. Now what's important about this, the, 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 the Native American tribes are fighting over limited resources. So they have constant low-level warfare among each other. They go to war, they get whatever it is solved they need to solve, and then they make peace. And this is all about polity and discussion that's going on, intertribal relationships that are going on out there in the tribes, um, on the plains. But most importantly, when the white man starts going out onto the plains in the 1870s, in the post-Civil War era, I want everybody to understand that the Native Americans are not just lying around out there waiting to be conquered. These are proud warrior nations. They have limited resources and limited personnel, as you would expect. It's a very tough lifestyle out there. But they're not just lying around waiting to be conquered. They have strong polities. They have strong traditions. They have a very warlike uh, um, uh, ability, capability, and technology with, contained within their tribal units. One last thing I want to remind everyone of. In other words, the Native American tribes are not just a pushover. They're not just waiting around. So I want to remind everyone of the five-step process. Now, we've talked about this before, but let me remind you once again. As the white man has pushed his way west, and this is under English-controlled North America after the Declaration of Independence and the American Independence, a War of American Independence. This is American, the Anglo-American mechanism as well a five-step process has sort of emerged. Step one is encroachment. Now encroachment could mean uh, any one of a number of things. Uh, in other words, you're just passing through and you insult somebody, you don't give them a present, uh, you, you don't interact well with a Native American tribe that you're dealing with. Now if you pass on by, you're okay. But this is encroachment. In other words, the white man is passing through and they're beginning to uh, use up the ecology, uh, the economic resources of the plains. This is in the post-Civil War era. So there's, when I use the phrase encroachment, it's all manner of things. Stealing horses, you, you name it, anything that you can imagine. Breaking a treaty, making a deal with the Native Americans, then breaking it. This is an encroachment. Then invariably that transitions to step two, the Native Americans react. As we're going to see in a little while, Sitting Bull is going to have a broken treaty on his hands. And he's going to say, well, then that means we Native Americans, the Sioux Nation, gets to do whatever they want. The white man's not going to honor the treaty. Then the treaty's no good. Treaty of Fort Fetterman. Okay? And so he's going to break off the reservation and go live free. And he did. That's just an example. So there's always a Native American reaction. The next step, step three, is a war will break out. A conflict will break out. Now, the beginning of this, sometimes it's Native Americans, sometimes it's white men. It just goes from case to case to case. But broadly speaking, we're talking about a war will break out, a conflict will break out. And typically, the Native Americans are initially successful. In other words, they feel like they're the aggrieved party, so they're going to hit first. Again, I draw your attention back to my previous statement. They're not just lying around waiting to get conquered. Well, then we go to uh, the next step which is the Anglo-Americans will react now this is forms in uh, you know there's an A and a B to this so A the, the, the Anglo-Americans will react the Native Americans were initially successful the white man will push back number A they use teamwork and this gives the white man the ability to fight in the winter so strong sidebar on this the Native American tribes are, are on the very edge of their ecology and their tribal economy. So in the winter, they have to pull together, set themselves up in a big giant sort of tent city near some water source, and hunker down for the winter, share their resources. They can't fight in the winter. They have to hunker down. But the white man has teamwork, and he has he can pull together and use his teamwork, and he can actually fight in the winter. In other words, you can get uh, you know looms and mills going in the east, make a whole lot of warm clothes, supply your guys with all sorts of equipment that allow them to fight in the winter, and they'll go hit the Native Americans when they're at a disadvantage. The second thing, that is to say, B, is technology, and this is invariably guns. 
until the very end of the Indian Wars, which ended around 7, 1899, really 1900 for the purpose of this class, the Americans are always going to be able to outnumber the Native Americans in the use of firearms. They get specific training on it, they get the latest equipment for the most part, and they just have more of it. In other words, they're able to sustain the use of firearms. And this invariably defeats the Native Americans. To be clear on this, and this is reiterating something from 1301, if you're a bowman on the Native American side, you're an archer, it takes a lifetime to build up the skill and the upper body strength to be able to use a bow and arrow. And that makes you, as a warrior, an extremely expensive commodity, an extremely expensive uh, a warrior. However, within a half an hour, 45 minutes of getting a gun in your hands, you can actually learn how to shoot it fairly well, and then in a half a day, you can actually be hitting pretty good targets. So that makes you a readily available and readily replaceable military commodity. So though a bow and arrow is actually dangerous, it's quite lethal, and men will die of being shot by bow and arrow right until the very end of the Plains Wars, the Americans, the Anglo-Americans, could simply flood the plains with gun-toting soldiers and just defeat the Native Americans. So that's really important. So once the Native Americans are wiped out, and that's step five, the, the white man grabs the land, and then the cycle begins again. So that last step is really, really fast. The Native Americans are wiped out, the white man grabs the land, and then the cycle begins again. So once again, we have a caterpillar effect. Step one, encroachment. Step two, Native American reaction. Step three, war breaks out. Native Americans are initially successful. Step four, the white man reacts with teamwork and technology. Step five, the natives are wiped out and the white man grabs the land and then does it again. Starts the cycle over again. All right, so with that reminder uh, firmly in mind, let's move on and talk a little bit more about Native American distribution and their internal poly. We're drilling down just the next step lower. To be clear, our thesis statement is the Native American tribes had everything we associate with civilization except an easily transmittable form of writing. The area west of the Mississippi was well populated and I'm just giving you a lot of evidence on that. So let's go on uh, with the next slide and take a look at this uh, drilling down one more step. Okay in this slide what I want to do is drill down kind of from the macro to the micro. Uh, I've taken the Sioux Nation. They're going to be involved in uh, the Custer Expedition, which we'll get to in a few minutes. And so they're a really good example. We know a lot about them. And they're a good example to kind of drill down a little bit. And our idea here is that the Sioux Nation is very, very sophisticated. Now at the top of the slide you can see that the Sioux Nation is, developed and is divided into three uh, slightly different linguistic groups. Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota. And the leader at the very top in the time frame we're talking about, the post-Civil War era, kind of in the 1870s, 1880s, is none other than Sitting Bull. And I'll have his photograph up in a little bit. Now, what's important about this, Sitting Bull was a great sachem, the great leader of an, a numerous people, S-A-C-H-E-M, great sachem. And so when we talk about Sitting Bull, I want you guys to understand that he's leading many tens of thousands of people. And should somebody come and visit him, which happened all the time, they would open up with a discussion. Usually there's going to be an exchange of presents. And then they're going to start talking to Sitting Bull. And within a very short period of time, he's going to understand exactly where they sit, where they are in the tribe, who they're related to, how they're related to him. He's going to know that. So think of that when you think of Sioux, Lakota, Nakota, and Dakota. This is a great, this is a huge number of people, many tens of thousands, and Sitting Bull is going to be the leader of them. If you go down a division, as you can see, you have the Teton, the Sisseton, the Yankton, the Yankton I, on and on and on, and each one of those subgroups are tens of thousands of individuals. Drill down one step further with the understanding that subtribes also make up, I don't know, the Wapakute, uh, the Sisseton, the Yankton, the Yankton I, but here's the Teton. And it is subdivided into the Blackfoot, the Brule, Hunk Papa, Mitakanju, Oglala, Sansarks, and Two Kettle. And each one of these 
are made up of bands of Indians that may be hundreds and hundreds of individuals. So hundreds and hundreds of different bands make up the Minikanju. Hundreds and hundreds of people in a different bands make up the Oglala. They make up the Teton, which is tens of thousands of individuals, and that makes up uh, the Lakota. And it just, so this is a huge structure. And the myth that I'm trying to dispel with this is that these are just unassociated, these are just people running around out there on the plains, chasing other, each other on horseback, hunting buffalo, and just having a good time. No, there's a polity out there. There are civilizations out there. There's a lot of structure going on up there. So with that in mind, let me continue on with some uh, photographic evidence, and I think you'll find the next few photographs really, really, uh, really kind of interesting. We'll just kind of put some meat on them bones. Uh, let's move on to the next couple of photographs and do a little bit of photographic analysis. All right, let's just take a look at this photograph. I have captioned it up there at the top, Hostile Camp, circa 1890 near Pine Ridge, South Dakota. And I got this from basically looking at the information that the photographer wrote on the photograph. You can see a sort of a white kind of pasted in caption, sort of lower left corner, and then on the very lower edge it says Hostile Indian Camp. Along the other, on the right edge, it's the photographer, it's the date, there's a lot of things going on here. So, Hostile Camp, circa 1890, near Pine Ridge, South Dakota. Well, let's take a look at this very carefully. If you look carefully, you'll see that there's a great number of teepees in here. Uh, these are all, you know, uh, buffalo hide teepees and a huge number of horses. Uh, there seems to be a little boy or, uh, you know, a young person kind of in the very center of the photograph. But what I want to draw your attention to is the number of teepees. Take a look at this very carefully. If you were to count it up, there would be hundreds and hundreds of teepees here with each one of these uh, dwellings filled with three to five to seven, fifteen people. There's a lot of people in each one of these. And then all the horses for transport. You can actually make out a few wagons. It's 1890. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing odd about that. So there's a huge number of, fo of people in this photograph. Again, our, the myth that I'm trying to destroy with this is that the plains were unpopulated or very sparsely populated. But you can see from this vast Native American city, basically, uh, there's a lot of people here. And this is a hostile camp that makes it basically a Sioux camp. And so, uh, there has to be Shoshones and Arapahoes and Crows and Kiowa all scattered across the plains, uh, kind of in cities like this, in towns like this, on a seasonal basis. To be clear, it's probably winter, it's either early spring or late winter, uh, the snow hadn't fallen yet, or it's already over with, and uh, they have not broken up to gather resources over the summer months. Okay, they just haven't done that yet. But here they are, they're kind of in this great big giant city. Let's move on to the second photograph and kind of continue on with this photographic analysis. Okay, in this photograph, what I want you to draw your attention to. Uh, in other words, the photographer who snapped that first shot that we saw, all he's done is picked up his camera, undoubtedly one of these great big giant box cameras on a, on a huge tripod, moved, I don't know, 50, 60 feet uh, to his right, set his tripod up, snapped this pic picture of General Nelson Miles and his staff being a large hostile camp near Pine Ridge, South Dakota, circa 1890. I know that because I've blown up the image and gotten out a, a, a magnifying glass and red, the little caption you see in white, kind of lower right. So let's go kind of macro a little bit. You can see that he's taking a different angle on the same village, but you're seeing a whole lot more teepees in the background and sort of trailing off into the horizon on the left and down into the valley on the right that you could not see in the previous photograph. It's a different angle. So, to be clear, this was an enormous Native American village. It's a huge city. There, there, there's tens of thousands of people involved in this photograph. And that can't possibly be all the teepees that you've seen that, that were actually there. Let's take a look at the phrase hostile for a second. That's in the caption. It uses that phrase in the caption. Now, if you'll take a look at General Nelson Miles, that fellow kind of uh, second from the left, that's who he is, on that magnificent horse, um, 
they're out there. This can't be a hostile camp. They don't have any weapons in evidence. They don't have, you know, a troop of cavalry escorts in evidence. They're out there with their dog, just riding around, looking at the natives. So it's not a hostile camp. And so what I'm driving at here is this is how the white population felt about Native Americans as late as 1890. The phrase had been coined earlier on in the uh, Plains Wars. Uh, William Tecumseh Sherman of Civil War fame. He had shifted his um, um, professional career out west to deal with Native Americans out there. And he had been in the Army since the 1840s, 1830s. And a newspaper man quoted him as saying that the only good Indian he had ever seen was dead. Well, that's not quite how it gets passed down in American history. In American history, uh, that gets paraphrased into the only good Indian is dead Indian. Now, after the Custer campaign in 1876, that's the way all Anglo-Americans felt about it. So when we see the phrase hostile, these are obviously not hostile Native Americans. They're not actively in, in war against the United States, or General Nelson Miles, his dog, and all those guys would have been dead long since. But I wanted to draw your attention to this because that's how the white population still felt about Native Americans. There's still a great deal of antagonism towards Native Americans as late as 1890s, and this really stems from the Custer Campaign of 1874, and especially the Custer Campaign of 1876. So we've gone from the macro down to the micro. Uh, we've gotten the West uh, um, well populated. You can see that there's plenty of evidence on that. So uh, let's go down one more to the real micro. And this is kind of the idea of, of white men usually thought of when they thought of Native Americans. But then we're going to put, uh, put a little bit of analysis. We're going to put this analysis to work on the next photograph. We're not going to spend much time on it. And then we're going to go kind of back to the macro again. And we'll talk about the Custer Expedition of 1874. To be clear, I just want to make sure that everybody understands that the, the United States, or America, west of the Mississippi, was heavily populated by a, by a highly sophisticated civilization of Native Americans, and it was about as heavily populated as the ecology would allow. So let's go down one more step micro, and then we'll come back kind of to, I don't know, mid-level sort of thing. All right? Okay, on analysis here, we're, we're drilling down absolutely to the micro. And on analysis here, what you're looking at is what? One, two, three, four TPs, kind of in the foreground here, kind of on the left there of the image. Uh, there's, I don't know, a half a dozen more. A few Native American individuals kind of hanging around looking at the photographer. He's looking at them, and they're looking at him. Uh, this happens to be a Shoshone camp. It's about 1870. Um, a Native American, obviously, uh, from the era looking at this, would be able to look at the symbiology and say, okay, this is exactly what's going on. But I have to rely on what the photographer has indicated on the back of the photograph uh, about what, you know, the picture he's taken here. But on analysis, what I really want you guys to get out of this is this is how most Americans of the era felt what was going on in the West. That we just have just a very few Native Americans very thinly spread, peppered across the West. And that's not true. That's what they perceive because that's what they would see in the summer months. In the winter, when the white man was safely at home someplace else and not traveling in the West, because it's too cold, it's too snowy, the Native Americans would be hunkered down in a big giant town or city or village in some valley someplace. But in the summer months, is what you're seeing here, they're scattered all over, peppered all over the countryside. So importantly, imagine if you will, there's another Shoshone village kind of on the other side of that high ground along the, the right background uh, of the photograph. And then kind of in the middle background down in that valley, there's another Shoshone village kind of way tucked way down in there. At those mountains in the deep background, there might be, you know, between what you see in the foreground and those mountains in the background, there could be 50 or 70 or 100 Shoshone little bands scattered out through there. And then somewhere out there, there's going to be kind of a, a, a boundary, and it'll be the Arapaho or the Crow or some other tribe, the Northern Cheyennes perhaps. 
and the, the, the Shoshone that you see, they will know that. The Nez Pierce are going to be out there someplace, and they will be peppering the land the same way. But the perception of the white population east of the Mississippi is exactly what you're seeing on this photograph. That there's hardly anybody out there. That the land is being just wasted because there's no one there. But we know that the ecology is being used to the maximum extent that it can probably uh, sustain. In other words, to feed all those people that you see there in the photograph, you got to hunt a lot of deer. you got to bring down a lot of game. And once you've hunted out some reason, region, you got to pack up these tents and go someplace else. Well, if you're moving into some valley that some other Native American band just left, then that area is going to be hunted out too. So hopefully you got to scout around, find some place where there's some sort of game left over, go there, hunt it out, and then you got to move again. On a more squalid sort of note, and white people talked about this all the time uh, when they went into a Native American village, think, if you will, uh, about waste disposal. There's no latrines. Native Americans didn't do that. They didn't know about that. And so you can't stay in any place for very long. It's going to be covered with fecal matter. I mean, it's just, just the way it is. Furthermore, if you're bringing in game to eat, you cut the animal up and you just leave the intestines lying around. There's no waste disposal. But why do you not need waste disposal? Because after a week or 10 days, you're packing up and moving out anyway. You're never going to revisit the same campsite, or it'll be two, three, four, five years before you do that. So you're always on the move. That's what I'm driving at. The Shoshone are always on the move. The Cheyenne, the Arapaho, the Crow, uh, the Kiowa. The Sh Everybody's always constantly, constantly on the move. And for that, you've got to have a vast amount of land. The ecology is being used to its maximum extent. And the Anglo-Americans did not understand that. Now let's go on to the next uh, couple of photographs here. We're going to start talking about the Custer Expedition of 1874. And the context of this is encroachment. The West is populated. Let's start pushing the Native Americans off the ground. Then we'll move on to the rest of Western migration. And in the 1890s, the frontier will be closed. What we're looking at here is uh, a photograph of the Custer expedition into the Black Hills in 1874. Now the context of this, again, it's westward expansion. But we've got to get rid of the Native Americans. And so we have kind of a five-step process. Encroachment, Native American reaction, a war breaks out and the Native Americans are initially successful. The Anglo-Americans in this case react with teamwork and technology. Step five, they wipe out the Native Americans, grab the land, and start the cycle again. So what we're talking about here is encroachment. Now there had been treaty after treaty after treaty. The Treaty of Fort Fetterman is one of them. It was very uh, lyrical in its language. As long as the grass grows and the wind blows, this land shall be yours forever and ever and ever. And that was the Treaty of Fort Fetterman in 1868, okay? And it was made in fairly good faith, but pretty quickly it's going to get broken. Now, the political context, and we're not going to go very far afield on this. Your book covers it fairly well. The Grant administration really kind of knew that they wanted to expand west. This is all about manifest destiny. We will talk about that later. And the Grant, uh, the Grant uh, administration instinctively sort of knew that. So the idea here is to provoke the Indians into a sort of a war, and then he could unleash the full force of the U.S. Army to go out there and wipe out the Indians, put them on the reservation, grab the land. Five-step process. So we have to start with a little bit of encroachment. And this is the Custer Expedition in the Black Hills, 1874. Now, on analysis on the photograph, this is what I want you guys to get at. We've got to kind of go down to the micro here. But at sort of mid-level, everybody believes, and this is a big myth in uh, American history today, and this really comes from, I don't know, the 1940s, 1950s, all these John Ford Westerns with John Wayne uh, riding through Monument Valley, and he's got this forlorn group of... Uh, you know, tough, hard, hard-bitten, uh, uh, forgotten soldiers, and they have some pennant and a bugler and maybe a wagon or two, and they're just patrolling around minding their own business. That's the myth. The reality <laughs> is what you see, because this was taken at the time, obviously. And if you count the number of wagons there, it's going to be over a hundred. It's all these, all these wagons, hundreds of them. 
take a look at the tents. They're in a big perimeter. There's some military camp. And so this probably, uh, I, I don't know, uh, the left near side, uh, that's like A troop. And then you're going to have B troop is going to be up there someplace. C troop on the perimeter. Across the top, D troop. And then just right on around. The horses are out there grazing. Uh, everybody's resting. They have this big military encampment. So when we talk about one of these expeditions, I want to be clear, and we're going to have several of them here in just a few minutes as we go on with the campaign. Any one of these expeditions has hundreds and hundreds, thousands of individuals, hundreds of horses, uh, uh, probably a, a medium-sized kind of herd of cattle, so that they'll have beef on the hoof to eat. It's going to be a giant expedition. And if you're a Native American and you're looking out onto the prairie and you see this big, giant uh, formation of men coming at you, you're being encroached upon. In other words, it's clear to you, it's obvious to you, that the white man is here to stay. He's cut a deal with you to stay away, and now he's coming anyway, so the treaty is broken. Let's go on to the next slide and uh, kind of uh, continue on with this theme about what one of these expeditions really does look like. And then we'll kind of go macro, uh, we'll talk about the motives, what happens next, and then we'll go to the Custer Campaign of 1876. Okay, this is the next photograph in a long series of photographs of the Custer Expedition 1874. Uh, George Armstrong Custer himself is actually in this photograph. He's the figure just left of center in the light colored clothing. That's him on the prairie 1874. Uh, the photographer's wagon is that square shaped wagon kind of on the left edge foreground of the photograph being drawn by a pair of mules. And he has unloaded his camera got it all set up on a tripod. Uh, they've stopped the entire column and they're having their photograph taken. Uh, we've kind of talked about this before, but let me kind of mention it again. Photography back in, the, back in those days was very primitive. And so uh, the shutter speed was really, really super low. By the time this photograph was taken, uh, uh, shutters had been invented, but the shutter speed is still very low. And you can kind of tell that uh, those images in the foreground, those individuals in the foreground, kind of on the right edge. You can see somebody's probably leant down. They're leaning down and they're, they're kind of sitting back upright in the saddle. And it blurred the image. So somebody was moving when the photo was snapped. Uh, by the way, those images uh, right there kind of on the right edge in the foreground, that's a cannon. And then there's another cannon right behind them. So then you have the photographer's wagon on the left edge. And then as you can see, this mile-long column of wagons being pulled by hundreds of horses, what, three, four columns wide, and probably a mile, mile and a quarter long. Then on either edge, you can see troops of cavalry. And they're all mounted up in columns of threes, it looks like, with all their officers there. Um, as it turns out on analysis, this is an exact formation, textbook, exactly the way it's supposed to be kind of in the left background, sort of on the horizon there. I mentioned before that there's going to be kind of a herd of cattle, so the men would have some food to eat, kind of beef on the hoof, and there they are. There's also going to be cavalry remounts. They're probably off the photograph. But think of yourself as a Native American, and you're out there on the prairie, and you see this massive column of men and equipment coming at you. You're being encroached upon, okay? And these guys are there to stay. They're also pretty much, it's pretty obvious, there to fight it out if they need to. Now the reason Custer was there, again, uh, Grant is trying to provoke a reaction from the Native Americans. We know that from his political papers. We know that from newspapers, articles of the time. And we know that there's a pattern of migration. The first group that goes west, uh, Frederick Jackson Turner talks about this, and we'll talk about him again later on. Frederick Jackson Turner talks about how there's a pattern of migration. We have miners and explorers, then we have settlers uh, and farmers, then we have cities and towns and technology. So in this group, Custer is kind of in the role of the explorer, and there are miners and uh, surveyors and assayers there in the column with them, and they're looking for gold. And they'll be panning for gold and trying to find gold this whole time in this expedition. And when they take all their ore samples back to uh, 
probably Bismarck, North Dakota, they're going to have it all assayed out and say, listen, we actually did find gold up there, and they will. That will spark a gold rush in turn. So this encroachment, when we talk about that in this case, this is going to be going on over a number of years. Treaty of Fort Fetterman was in 1868. This is in 1874. Another expedition is going to take place in 1876. To be clear, you guys, now go macro from here. There will be expedition after expedition after expedition, all the way to the Modoc War, 1898-1899. There will be one to go after Cochise and Geronimo. That's in Arizona and New Mexico. That will be in the 1880s, 1890s. There's going to be another uh, expedition against the Ute Indians in uh, modern-day Utah. There will be one against the Yakimals up in Washington State. One after another after another. So when you think of these expeditions, think about what you're seeing in the slide, not what Hollywood have you believe with just one or two guys, I don't know, dancing with wolves, one guy out there on the prairie, and that's, you know, that's, that's our, our lone warrior out there trying to lead this expedition. No, this is what they actually look like. Okay, well, with that in mind, uh, let's go on to the Custer campaign. I'm sorry, Gold in the Black Hills. We'll take a look at what they're finding, and this is going to motivate the next step. Uh, still more encroachment, and then we'll get some uh, reaction from the Native Americans. Okay, well, uh, we uh, have this slide here, and this is kind of what's going to be always motivating people to go west. This is one of them, and we'll talk more about that later. And undoubtedly, uh, your eye might have been drawn to that image kind of there on the lower right, and that is a big chunk of Alaska gold. Well, that's a lot of drama right there, 293 ounces of drama. Uh, I think I've done the math on that. Uh, it's, I don't know, half a million dollars worth of rock. And that's a very captivating idea. In other words, there's a rock out there that you can pick up, and that turns immediately into money. Gold has been the disridium of economics since time immemorial, since Roman times, since Egyptian times. Gilgamesh understood that gold was important. So the idea that Custer is going to go out there with this expedition, do kind of what's on the left side of the image. This is called placer mining uh, in uh, the Oregon territories. It's just an example. Uh, you build a sort of sluice, this sort of box-shaped ramp. You divert a creek into that so you have water, and then you just throw a whole bunch of soil into that. The, the gold in dust or uh, powder form will sort of filter out and collect in the bottom of that that sort of trough, that sluice. And then all you got to do at the end of the day is just go by and pick it out of there and you know you've made a week's wages like that. Hard work, backbreaking work, middle of the wilderness, uh, very lonely, very difficult stuff to do, but potentially very, very profitable if you have a rich strike. So to make a long story short, Custer's Expedition 1874 did turn up gold in the Black Hills. Now the fact that he went into that area was a provocation. It's a uh, uh, violation of the Treaty of Fort Laramie. It's a violation of uh, the Treaty of Fort Fetterman. Uh, there are several treaties that have been made with the Native Americans, especially the Sioux and the Cheyenne, that the white man would not go into that area. It was protected. But Grant is going to say, send an expedition up there, see if we can find some gold. Gold was found. That sparks a gold rush. This is encroachment. So let's get on to the Custer campaign of uh, 1876 and kind of drill down a little bit. Again, we've got to put this in the right context. Okay. So the next slide is going to be basically an outline, a lot of verbiage on it. Let's go over this. Again, a note in your note taking. If I give you some, uh, a lot of verbiage in a slide, write down the first issue and then listen to what I'm saying. Write down the second one, listen to what I'm saying. If you try to write them all down, you'll miss the, the, the voiceover that I'm giving to you now. And then you'll have to go back and listen to it again. So just write down the first bullet point and then I'll talk about it. Write down the second bullet point and I'll fill that in. Okay? So let's go on to the next slide. All right, this is just a brief outline of the Custer campaign of 1876. So we're kind of going uh, macro, and this fits perfectly into our five-step process. The encroachment, I've just laid that out in the previous few slides. 
uh, now uh, basically this is continue on, but a war is going to break out, and the Native Americans are going to be initially successful. Uh, uh, there's not a mystery here; something bad is going to happen to Custer. But then the Native Americans are going to get wiped out. Okay, uh, the way Anglo Americans are going to react, they're going to wipe out the Native Americans and then grab all the land. That's exactly what happened. So the encroachment part, we're kind of over with that. Now the Native Americans will react, and I'll get to that one in the next couple of slides. But I want to talk about the Custer campaign in 1876. So why? The Custer campaign has to be a model, you guys, a metaphor for all of the other campaigns. Much like the photographs and the evidence I've given you in the previous few slides have been uh, evidence for the big picture, the Custer campaign is going to be uh, um, a mechanism for you guys to understand what all these other expeditions are going to be like. George Crook, who we'll run into in a minute, he's actually going to lead, lead another campaign against Cochise and Geronimo. Uh, the Modoc War in 1888, uh, I'm sorry, 1898 and 1899, we've already talked about that. There's going to be campaigns against Chief Joseph, Joseph and the Nez Pierce. There's going to be one campaign after another after another. So when we take a look at this, I want you guys to understand that this is a metaphor, a model for all the others. What I'm going to tell you is going to be as accurate as I can give, give you at this level. Of, of your education, uh, at least enough to get through the course. But if you really are interested in this, there's lots of material out there that you can uh, um, investigate to take a look at all these different campaigns. This is simply one of the first among many, many, many campaigns. So let's take a look at this, and that's the reason why. Number two, the second bullet point. It is a major defeat for the U.S. Army, but the beginning and the end for the Native tribes. So to be clear, our five-step process was an encroachment, a war breaks out, I'm sorry, Native American reaction, then number three, a war breaks out and the Native Americans are initially successful. So this is step three. I'll back up and get step through two in a minute, but we'll get step three now. So it is a major defeat for the U.S. Army. Custer's going to be defeat, but he's not the only one, as you're about to see. But it's the beginning of the end for the Native tribes, and I have that part underlined. So as late as the 1880s, 1890s, all the military and the people, the civilian population of America, is going to be continually saying, look, we've got to give one back for Custer. You know, we've got to get back at, at, what, for, at the Native Americans for what happened to Custer. We've got to go out there and, you know, we've got to even the score a little bit. Well, the Modocs in 1898 did not know anything about Custer. That had been 30 years before. Cochise and Geronimo were 1,200 miles away, and 25 years later, they don't know anything about the Custer campaign. They didn't have anything to do with it. But to the white population, to the Anglo-American population, this is going to be a big motive to annihilate the Native Americans. It's going to be a huge excuse to annihilate the Native Americans west of the Mississippi. So, last point, virtually all subsequent dealings with any Native tribe is going to be gauged against the Custer campaign. Now, good strong side note on this. A pattern emerges. If a Native American tribe resists and fights back against the Anglo-Americans really, really hard, particularly if they're a little bit successful, they're going to get a really, really super bad treaty. And that will affect them right down to the present day. However, if they sort of try to assimilate, if they try to cooperate, if they're you know, friendly and outgoing towards the U.S. government, then as it turns out, they're going to be able to get a really good treaty in the 19th century, and that too will positively affect the tribe today. So for example, uh, we've talked about this in another venue, especially in 1301, uh, the five civilized tribes, they cooperated. That is the Cherokee, Choctaw, Creek, Seminole, uh, and Chickasaw. And they are from... Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, and through there. They cooperated in the 1830s and 1840s and were peaceably removed into Oklahoma. But because they cooperated, because they assimilated, their treaties are really, really good. And sure enough today, to give you a rather uh, squalid example, if you will, if you go up to Durant, Oklahoma, you can go to Choctaw Bingo. And it's a big, beautiful hotel. Uh, you can go into the Choctaw Nation and, uh, you know, gamble. You can get uh, low-cost cigarettes, low-cost alcohol, because I don't have to pay any taxes. If you go through southeastern Oklahoma, uh, there are hospitals. 
uh, and schools everywhere built for the Native American tribes. If you're part of those tribes, as long as the tribe has money, you basically get to go to school for free if you, if you are part of the tribe. And that all stems from a very positive treaty at the beginning. But if you go to the Apache nations, which is all the way out in um, parts of New Mexico, but mostly in Arizona, they resisted. So they get nothing. They don't get much. Their treaties were really bad. Were really, really bad. It's no different with the Sioux. You go up into the Dakotas today, uh, Wind River Reservation, it's, it's this ter- the situation there is terrible. They live in abject poverty. Uh, unemployment is really, really super high in, in the 90 percentile. They're cold in the winter. They overheat in the summer. Uh, those poor individuals are really, um, really in a bad way up there uh, in, in Pine Ridge and all in through there in, in the Wind River, Wind River Reservation. The situation is difficult because the Sioux resisted. Now, each tribe is a little bit different, but that pattern emerges here. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, let's go on to the next map, and it'll be a map of the Custer Campaign of 1876. Okay, we can see here from the map, uh, and it's labeled the three-pronged movements of the Sioux Campaign of 1876, really the Custer Campaign 1876. Those phrases are interchangeable. So let's put what you see on the map into kind of the macro, into the big picture. So number one, we have encroachment. And this was in 1874. Uh, the Grant administration wants to provoke a war so they can grab all the land. They kind of have a, an, an instinctive feel for the five-step process. Again, the five-step process, that's me trying to help you guys to contextualize the information here. In other words, you're not going to find that in a book. Well, the next step then was Native American reaction. And if you look on the map, kind of uh, on the right side, it says the Great Sioux Reservation. Well, the Treaty of Fort Fetterman and the Treaties of Fort Laramie, 1860s, 18, early 1870s, had basically told Sitting Bull and the Sioux Nation in the Northern Cheyenne Look, this great big giant region is yours as long as the grass grows and the wind blows. It's very, very, uh, very lyrical. And Sitting Bull, and I'll have his photograph up in a minute, uh, he was like, he understood the treaty. He was very, he was very clever. Uh, he spoke English. He wasn't going to let anybody pull the wool over his eyes. He's a highly sophisticated a sachem, a, 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 basically a politician on the Native American side. And he'd seen this movie before. This is a rerun for him. But he said, listen, if that's what you guys want, if that's what's going to save my people, then we will go on this big, giant area, this huge reservation, and that's where we will remain. But you guys got to promise not to come into that area. The Black Hills are basically sacred to them, and you can't go into that area. And that's what Sitting Bull negotiated. And that's what had been agreed upon at Fort Fetterman and Fort Laramie, particularly at Fort Laramie and Fort Fetterman as well. Then in 1874, Custer had gone into the Black Hills, you can see it listed there on the map, and discovered gold, so that started a gold rush. So the Native American reaction, I said I was going to go over this, and now I am. When Custer went in in 1874, and a subsequent gold rush brought lots of white men into the Black Hills region, Sitting Bull understood that the treaty was useless, it had been broken. And so he said publicly and repeatedly, therefore, I'm just going to go live as I would normally live. I'm going to go where I want to go. I'm going to follow the buffalo. We're going to go up onto the greasy grass. We're going to go up into the Yellowstone country. And we're going to live as we would normally have lived. And they're going to have to hunt me down. Well, that was the very provocation, or that's the very reaction, that Grant Custer's uh, provocation was designed to elicit. That's what they were driving for. So 1875, 1876, Sitting Bull, the Northern Cheyenne and the giant Sioux Nation, many tens of thousands of individuals scattered out onto the broad northern prairies and hunted the buffalo as they'd always done. Therefore the Grand Administration could authorize this big giant campaign to corral Sitting Bull. Drove Sitting Bull to this and now the war's got to break out. Let's start with Crook's column. 
They leave Fort Fetterman early on in 1876 and start heading north. The idea, they're part of a three-part pincer movement to pin down the Native American tribes. Now, George Crook's picture is coming up in just a few minutes, so bear with me. If you want to skip ahead, take a look at him, and then come back to the slide, that's perfectly appropriate. Okay, but what I'm driving at here, Crook's column is not just a few guys with some w weapons on horseback, you know, riding across the prairie. It's one of those huge columns that we saw in that earlier photograph. Hundreds of wagons, cannons, quite possibly Gatling guns, hundreds of men, cattle, horses, the whole thing. And they're moving across the prairie. Now, Crook was an old Indian campaigner. He'd done that his whole life. He had a very distinguished Civil War record. So, to be clear, you guys, and please take a strong note on this, Crook is an experienced general with the best technology of the age at his disposal. He's not just some guy out there running around on the prairie hoping to get the best, get the best deal. He's a highly experienced officer leading this huge column. And he reported in his logbooks day after day after day as they're traveling across the prairie there, open country of not seeing any Native Americans at all. They went, you know, day one, day seven, day 14, day 22, and hadn't seen anybody. Now this says less about Crook and more about the Native Americans. When they saw this huge column moving across the prairie, they used their network, their, their, their networking system, and, and scattered and got out of the way of these guys and stayed hidden. They did not reveal themselves. The Native Americans knew Crook was there and was moving north, as we're going to find out, but they scattered and stayed out of his way. So to be clear, you guys, we've got tens of thousands of Native Americans out there in that in front of Crook's column, and he doesn't see a single one. This is not the singular example of that phenomenon. Custer had done the same thing coming out of Fort Riley and going across Kansas, basically to the Colorado border and back, and didn't see a soul knowing full well that the Kiowa and the Southern Cheyenne were out there. So the West is populated, but the white man can't find them. This is good on the Native Americans. In the wide open prairie where there's not a single tree to be found for 100 miles, they can stay hidden. Okay? So just be thinking about that. Now finally, Custer gets to one of the branches of the Yellowstone River. I think the greasy grass or the bighorn. There's the greasy grass and the little bighorn and then the, the, the bighorn river. And there's one of those branches. And you can see it up there where he kind of makes that U-turn. So when he got up into that region, a, a dynamic young Native American warrior named Crazy Horse, and we will get to him in a minute, uh, led an attack on Crook. And this is really important. Take good, strong notes on this. Crazy Horse had a different mechanism for fighting. Up until this point, the Native Americans, when they fought, part of their honor, part of their tradition was to count a coup, C-O-U-P, on their adversary. And that meant you had to ride up to the guy and touch him. Well, when you ride up to a, a, an Anglo-American who's got a six-shooter or a rifle, you're going to get shot and get killed. But to the Native Americans, this was part of their tradition, part of their honor system. So they tried that and tried that and tried that, and they lost a lot of warriors that way. And we've talked about that before. Uh, a single warrior is extremely valuable as a military commodity. Well, Crazy Horse analyzed this, and he said, no, don't do that. We'll shoot and kill all these Americans and fight together as a team. Follow orders. Exhibit a little bit of uh, what we would call today military discipline. And then when the fighting is over, then you may go to the guy that you feel like you killed and, and touch him and count your coup upon him. Get your honor that way. This revolutionizes Native American combat against the white man. Not every fight was done this way, but it begins to change the game a little bit. And as we're going to see, this is really, really important. So Crook went all the way basically straight north traveled several hundred miles, didn't see anybody, and then out of nowhere, uh, Crazy Horse came down with huge bands of highly mobile, extremely able, and well-disciplined warriors, defeated him, 
and caused him to turn around and go all the way back to Fort Fetterman in defeat. So let me reiterate that part. The Native Americans defeated Crook with a huge troop of men, cannons, Gatling guns, the latest technology, and he was a highly experienced officer. Now Custer and Terry and Gibbon, and we'll all get to those guys in just a few minutes, they didn't know that. They had no way of finding that out. So Crook is out of this thing. Now, Alfred Terry is the commander of George Armstrong Custer, and we'll get to them in a minute. His picture is coming up next. They move out of Bismarck, uh, Fort Lincoln, Bismarck, North Dakota, and they begin moving, as you can see out there, they begin moving to the west. Now, they follow the Yellowstone. Uh, they get across the greasy grass. They get across the, the Bighorn River. And then Custer says, listen, you've got to split me off. Terry was an infantry commander. He was burned down with Gatling guns and artillery. Custer says, you've got to give me the cavalry so I can go off and find the Indians. Well, Terry thought about this and then agreed with it. Now, this is controversial, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But Terry had told Custer, you have to stay in contact with me. And if you see the Native Americans, you have to just pin them down and let me bring up the rest of the column, and then we'll defeat them as a team. And very ambiguously, Custer said, well, okay. Well, okay to which one? Pin the Indians down or stay in contact? What are you going to do? But Custer said, okay, that's what I'll do. And he took off. What everybody pretty much knew, and even Terry knew this, is once Custer was cut loose, he was going to hit the Native Americans and never stop. And we'll talk about the reason why later on. But as you know, Custer's going to be wiped out. Crook got defeated, and then Custer got wiped out. Well, this meant that Terry, his cavalry component, was defeated. I want to be clear, Custer was not the only cavalry unit that Terry had, but that was his best guys, and they got wiped out. The survivors were badly shaken up, and that meant that Terry's column was crippled. He was too strong on infantry and not strong enough in cavalry in cavalry country. So Terry's going to have to turn around, and he's going to have to run for it. We'll write about that. that leads us to Gibbon, John Gibbon. And we'll get to John Gibbon again in just a second. His photograph is coming up on the next slide. He lives from Bozeman. He leaves from Bozeman, Fort Ellis, as you can see there on the map. He's got an infantry heavy column. They travel along the Yellowstone River. They're trying to sweep these Native Americans into a big bag. But then, as you can see there, he loops around, goes down to the Custer battlefield, and discovers all these dead guys and this finds out about this giant defeat. So think of Gibbon's position. He is suddenly out there on the prairie, basically by himself, with huge numbers of Native Americans who are victorious.